The most successful attempt to provide a mechanical explanation for gravity came from the Swiss-born scientist Lesage. He was born in 1724 in Geneva. He was an atomist and wanted to explain all properties of matter in terms of collisions and conglomerations of atoms. He saw a way to use this to explain gravity itself. The Sage's theory is interesting for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is a prototype of a dynamical explanation of Newtonian gravity. Secondly, it actually comes very close to accomplishing this. We will examine later modifications to this main theory in later videos, but for now it is important to understand that this theory is able to describe all of the effects of gravity we know today. There are some side effects from this theory, which in the end were its main downfall. But as we will see in future videos, these downfalls may in fact be key pieces of evidence that we are able to explain with minor modifications to this theory. The third point to know is that this theory has been around for a long time and attracted comments by leading physical thinkers over several successive generations. So let's get to the crux of Lesage's theory of gravity. He imagined that the universe was filled with a sea of very small particles he called ultramundanes. The main properties of these particles are that they have a minute mass, enormous speed, and travel in straight lines, and are completely inelastic. Nowadays we know that most matter is actually composed of mainly void space. The space between the protons and the electrons is far greater than the size that they occupy. These ultramundane particles pass through most matter as if it did not exist. Now this notion of an atom with mainly void would not be confirmed until the early 20th century. Now the important point to note is as these particles pass through the atoms, occasionally they may collide with the nucleus and be absorbed. Now this does not occur very often, but the more mass an object has, the greater the chance that this may occur. Now if you think this is a little too far-fetched, then I only need to bring your attention to the neutrino. This is a particle which, for the most part, passes through all matter. The neutrinos are, however, too few in number to be our actual ultra-mundane particle. So how do these particles actually create gravity? To simplify this, we will consider this in only one dimension. So imagine that there are ultramundane particles travelling in either direction from side to side. If we place a large body on one side of the screen and assume that some of these particles will be absorbed by the body, you will see that part of the component moving from left to right will be missing to the right of the body, and vice versa. If we now introduce another body to the left of this one, it too will have the same effect. And it should now be clear that in between these two bodies, there are less ultramundane particles due to the absorption of some of them by either body. If we now consider that each time an ultramundane was absorbed, the kinetic energy of the impact was transferred to the body, it should become obvious that there is an inward force on both bodies causing them to move towards each other. So where in the standard view of gravity we see a pull force, here we see a pushing force from the sea of ultramundane particles. To complete this picture we must take this 1D view and add in the movement from all possible directions. And when this is done, what we will find is that this theory not only produces a force which is proportional to the mass, but also falls off with a square of distance between them. A critical aspect of this model, recognized by Lesage himself, was related to the nature of the collisions between the ultramundane particles and the matter itself. These collisions could not be entirely elastic, as this would lead to rebounds which would cancel out the pushing force. 
Instead, they would have to be wholly or partly inelastic. And if it was partly, then they would rebound with a reduced velocity. Lord Kelvin in 1873 became very interested in Lesage's theory. After he had published his kinetic theory of gases, he saw great parallels in how the two theories complemented each other. In his writings on this, he quickly determined that there would be a finite range of gravity beyond which its force would not be felt due to the noise of the background ultramundane particles. He determined that this range was proportional to the mean free path of the Lesage ultramundane particles, which would in turn determine their diameter and numerical density. At the time, Lord Kelvin estimated that if the particles were small enough, this range would be beyond our current visible limit. And this became an important concept as with a finite gravity range, it would be possible to have a gravitationally stable universe, i.e. not contracting over time. Kelvin's main contribution to Lesage's work lies in the collisions. He argued that the elastic collisions might be feasible if after rebound, the translational energies were given over to rotational or vibrational energies conserving the total energy of the system. The Sage's model had been criticized for requiring an endless expenditure of energy from the outside. It had also been shown that these rotational energies would later be restored via other collisions, keeping the ratio of the different types of translational energy constant. And this eliminates the problem of gravity slowly being reduced as all the kinetic energies are converted to rotational energy slowing the average movement of the particles down. Even the likes of Poincaré and Maxwell were interested in this concept. In the end, Maxwell was the figure who put a nail in the coffin for this concept for a considerable amount of time. He condemned the theory based on thermodynamic grounds, stating that the temperature of bodies must tend to approach that at which the kinetic energy of the ultramundane corpuscles Maxwell assumed that the kinetic energy of the corpuscles, the ultramundanes, was much larger and therefore ordinary matter should be incinerated within seconds under the Lesage bombardment. Preston, however, questioned Maxwell's assumption that the number of corpuscles was much smaller than the number of particles of ordinary matter. Preston demonstrated that if you assumed a large quantity of corpuscles with a small mass, this would allow the Lesage gravity pressure to be maintained despite the low kinetic energy. As you can see, this theory has existed for a considerable amount of time with equal supporters and opposers to it. So the main problems have hampered the development of the Lesage model, which can be summarized as follows. Number one, if the collisions are partly inelastic, the transfer of energy would cause a heating effect. Depending on the mass and the velocity used, this could create a vast amount of energy that would build up over time. Secondly, planets which orbit the Sun have to move through these particles, and this could cause a drag effect, which we do not see. Both Kelvin and Lesage got around this problem by having the corpuscles travel at speeds much greater than the speed of light, and having almost negligible mass. However, when general and special relativity were introduced, this was yet another nail in the coffin, as nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. Number three, if we assume elastic collisions as Kelvin proposed, then this would lead to a buildup of corpuscles around the large body. The combined influence of these and the many negative assessments in conjunction with a general shift away from the mechanical ether theories has led to the progressive loss of interest in the Lesage theory. So why have I included this concept if it is so flawed? Because this is not the end of the story for push gravity. There are many scientists, including Halton Arp, who have come to adopt and modify Lesage's theory of push gravity. And that is why it is important to understand the basic concept that Lesage introduced and the noted limitations of this model. Over the next few episodes, I want to explore some of these modified theories so that we can see how these limitations can be removed 
and how many interesting aspects of this theory could lead into several alternative theories not directly related to gravity, such as planetary heat emissions, planetary growth, and mass increase over time, and cosmic background radiation, as well as explain some of the more gravity-related concepts such as galaxy rotation and gravitational shielding. And lastly, a massive thank you to all of my Patreon supporters and those people who have made donations via PayPal. It makes a huge difference. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.